Welcome to With All Due Respect. This is a podcast for women over 40 who are looking for sane, frank advice about their health and wellness, especially through and after menopause. I'm Amanda Thieb, a personal trainer and nutrition coach and the author of the best-selling book, Menopocalypse, how I learned to thrive during menopause and how you can too. I'd love you to join me every week as I chew the fat with some fab guests on hot topics that directly impact you. I also know the power of conversation is lost and there's nothing better than sitting down for a natter with your mate and putting the world to rights. And that's exactly what I'll be doing with this podcast. We'll really get to know my guests, what's and all. I've made it my mission to help you by exploding a few myths and presenting you with plain, simple facts. These inspiring conversations will hopefully empower you to be a healthy, strong, resilient bitch, you know, just like me. Before we get started, don't forget to hit subscribe and leave a review and then visit me at amandatheeb.com. And now let's get started on today's show. I think I've been talking about menopause for about eight to 10 years now, and I've met some amazing people over that time. Last year, I became connected with Naomi Watts. We've started discussing menopause because of her own experience through early menopause and how she felt a desire to be more vocal and use her platform to reach more women. We've since then met a couple of times and had some great conversations and I was super, super excited that she decided to come onto the podcast and have a little natter all about it. I really do hope you enjoy today's episode because I had a ton of fun. Speak to Naomi. Enjoy. Hi, Naomi. Thank you for coming on my show. I feel so honored. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Amanda. Super happy to be here. Thank you for having my book on display on your bedside. Yes, I thought, you know, that's basic reading these days, you know, (laughs) trying to plow through that pile of good information. But it's it's good news because there was a time, I'm sure you can remember, that where it was hard to find anything to get your hands on and, and dive into. You felt like completely out there alone, wondering what the hell was going on and just to have that many books available now is, is great news. It's so such progress. And if it makes you feel better, what I have on my bedside cabinet is your lube or your play oil. So there you go. Yeah. So do you. <laughs> and by Product the way, placement I, here, shamelessly or unshamelessly. Not, well, honestly, yeah, let's be unshameless about ourselves. But also, like, it gets a thumbs up from the other part of my life as well. My husband's oh. like super happy with it. And he's like, why doesn't it come in a travel size? And I'm like, I don't know. It's going to happen. It does. It does. Just- Tell your husband you are ready for the summer. We have the minis now. Yep. We, right, can, good stuff. <laughs> we can celebrate that. Yes, because that is too much of a thing to shove in your luggage. I agree. Um, oh, right. But, and we also like need to be prepared. Like, I don't know about you, but I can't go anywhere without being prepared now. And if I'm going for a weekend away, like I need something on hand. And I yeah. love it though. I've never used oil before and it's like a, a vaginal lubricant and it's so nice. Yes. So and nice. also if, if you're feeling, um, you know, you don't want to be, you know, having to stop in the, in the middle of anything there's the badge of honor which is one of our top sellers and that is like a daily moisturizer you can use it daily or you can use it every other day however you like but it's it's it gets you gets things going ahead of time and it really is long lasting so if you don't well, want to I love stop. those products my two fa- and we have, I wasn't talking about the products later but we might as well talk about them now I love the power move which is and that's why my skin looks so amazing today I'm just joking oh, and my yes, the power move and the badge of honor and the oh my glide and oh my god Naomi what where did you get up, come up with these names I mean that I, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in these meetings like what should we call these things yes well I've always loved words you know coming from the world that I come from is an actor storytelling and, you know, you work with text all the time and playing on words has always been fun for me. And, you know, Lord knows menopause is, you know, full of plenty of ups and downs and we've seen it all. We've done it all. We feel like we've cried and suffered through some ugly, you know, unbearable moments. So you you just sort of feel like, well, there's got to be some joy. There's got to be some ways to just put a smile on 
a woman's face at this point, you know, we've, and that's actually why I wanted to call it stripes because we have gone through ups and downs. We've seen a lot and, you know, we've earned our stripes by this point and wisdom and cumulative experiences amount to something. You are relevant. You are not invisible and you matter. So I wanted a woman to feel like this could be a time where you can feel celebrated, decorated, you've earned your stripes. So, and then that led to like, how do we create names for these products? You know, so many times you look at these products and they just, they go with the functionality rather than the storytelling. And again, as a, as someone who's involved in storytelling, I wanted it to be something that made you know, a little tongue in cheek, a little little smile, a little play on words, as well as, you know, describing the usage and things like Vag of Honor. Yes, let's honor the Vag. She still works. She's still, you know, a vital and part of your she life. She still wants to work. Yeah, she, she still yeah. wants to keep working. So yeah. just honor that lovely thing down there. So, and then things like the power move it, that really was based on the fact that it's just powerful ingredients. And, and then we've got the full Monty, which I'm sure you can appreciate. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) I mean, I think that, I think maybe one of the things I like about the names is I think your English humor and sensibility comes through doesn't it? Like yeah. there's definitely like, I have a little chuckle at some of them. I'm like, yeah. that's cheeky. I like yeah. it. Yeah. You've got to have a laugh, right? You've got this. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it's a way in it's, it gives you more accessibility because yes, it is sometimes it does feel like doom and gloom, but you know, no, it's not. And just moving through the awkwardness can be much easier with a laugh. So I was going to say that, like when I wrote the book and I know when you talk as well, like that there's got, there's humor there. And I believe that people remember things when it's delivered with humor. And I don't mean that in a diminishing way, because sometimes comedy can be diminishing, but I mean, in a way that gives humor that makes you sort of self-reflect. And and I know that people remember things I say because I'm a little bit cheeky and but I see the and I see the woman in front of me, and I know that that's the aim of this, right? You're looking at the person in front of you and saying, "I see you, I get you, I am the same as you, right?" Yeah, that's I, and I loved your book for that reason. I had many moments where I was laughing out loud, and yeah, it's relatable. And there is, as I said, there's so many moments to just feel like, "Oh, this is I, all I want to do is just crawl into a hole." <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, you know, so we need to laugh and wherever you can infuse humor, it's so necessary. We need that break. We need that way to just have a moment. But yeah, on, and that really relates to, you know, like I, I, for me, all of the doom and gloom was around the perimenopause stage. And that was because I was ahead of my peers. My peers weren't really available to speak about it. I didn't feel like the conversations I was having with doctors were that nuanced. And so I felt really alone. I felt like when the conversation wasn't available, I really turned in on myself. And so as along with trying to cope with these symptoms, you know, so it's the psychological experience as well as but you did know, you know through that- the sheets. Did you know these were hormonal symptoms? Like when you were going through this, did you actually know? Or were you one of the people like me that were going through this and trying to get answers, but couldn't get answers? Well, no. I mean, the thing is, is that I was having night sweats and irregular periods at the same time as trying to get pregnant and start a family. I was 36 years old and I was really confused as to why I wasn't getting pregnant. And a a girlfriend of mine who's a bit older said, why don't you go and get a blood panel? And I said, okay, fine. So I went to see my gynecologist and he said the results suggested that I was close to menopause. And I basically nearly fell off my chair. I was in shock. I did have this memory that my mother had said uh, that she had gone into menopause at 45, but I had no other information surrounding that, no detail. I didn't know that there were years leading up to it that she suffered with symptoms and worry and fear and aloneness and panic and all of those things. I didn't know. I didn't know what it meant. And there was no word perimenopause point at that point, or if it was, I'd never heard it. I only heard that 
term probably in the last five years. Yes, yeah, same, I would say like eight to eight, five to eight years, same. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I I panicked and walked out of the office with, you know, in tears and then called my mom and said, well, you know, tell me more about your menopause. You said that you went in at early and, and it, I, I remembered that she'd said 45, but I was only 36. I thought I'm okay. I've got time. And, you know, I'm watching people having babies in their forties and late forties and, you know, sometimes even their fifties, what's going on? Um, and, and she said, yeah, well, I, I said, why didn't you tell me more? And she said, well, I, I didn't have these conversations with you because my mother never had them with me. And, you know, like the, just the, the baton was passed, this code of silence that was agreed upon where women are just supposed to grin and bear it. And wow, I was in shock. And so now I had to sort of try and find a way to get pregnant. And, and you know, long story short, mercifully, I was able to get pregnant naturally. I wasn't a candidate for um, IVF. I, I tried um, Clomid, IUIs. I did everything but none of those things worked. And, you know, I mean, if you want to get into nutrition, which I know is your expertise, I for sure changing my diet and lifestyle was the thing that that helps. Not your body feel ready, maybe, but you have two beautiful children two now. Gorgeous and, kids. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a really yeah. good segue into like the next sort of thing I wanted to ask you, because you seem to have a really great way of keeping your family and your personal life like out of the public eye and for somebody who's so well known that must be really challenging and I commend the way you do that but then all of a sudden you're private all of a sudden you're talking about you're talking about your vagina so can you can you square that circle for me (laughs) I know how did this happen Amanda (laughs) I am really private and I, I really work hard at that it's bizarre but really I think based on what I was just telling you, feeling like I was alone and panicky about that time and place um, and like there were no resources. I just, I thought that was just not, it didn't make any sense given that half the population was headed here. I wanted to write a book back then because I thought, you know, women deserve to be seen. Women deserve to not feel alone and and have information. But, you know, I, at that point, and by the way, just to finish off where I was going with the with the early menopause, I, after having kids, I, I basically went into hardcore symptoms pretty much straight away. I, I think I was about 42. And that's when I started having these ideas of like, this feels so unfair. Why aren't women getting the necessary support? Why are we forced to be alone? And, you know, we don't even have each other to talk to, let alone, you know, enough data or, or information. And um, so I, uh, I just know that now that I'm the other side of 50, that there's a lot of other women out there. Like I, my story is not unique. So there should be a place for people to come, whether that's, you know, reading a pile of fantastic books or whether that's creating a brand that is gives simple solutions or, you know, providing them with ed- education and creating a community. That that was when it occurred to me that it's necessary. We're living longer. Why shouldn't we set ourselves up better for the last chapter of our lives? And why shouldn't we feel our best? And, you know, there are many women doing great things from their 50s and onwards. And so, yeah, I sorry, I can't hold the secret any longer. I, this is the sort of, yes, I'll still remain private, private about certain things in my life, but this is one that just felt necessary and meaningful. And I felt passionate about it. Yeah, and you became purpose driven in this goal, the same as me, right? It's like uh, I I had the conversation with my husband, who's extremely private. I don't, I think he's only on LinkedIn because he was made to with work, but he's never mm. anywhere. And even if I post pictures of him, I never say his name, or I'll just say, oh, you know, right. my hubby. Yeah, it's I always have to get permission, and I yeah. respect all of that, right? I'm like a social media whore, you know me, like I'm <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> it's shocking. Yeah, I vacillate. I know it's a tough thing. <laughs> isn't it because and especially being English where we're you know it's in our blood our DNA to sort of shrink and apologize for everything and say 
and not self-promote at all. Like you know, oh, self-deprecation yeah. is in, at the core of who we are. And then living in North America, it's a different thing. I mean, Canadians less so, but when I moved to America, I nothing was more of a culture shock than this like high level confidence of people just saying, you know. Crazy, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So. I don't feel like I can do that. But I did, but I did have the conversation with my husband and just said, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Like, and I wrote the book and then I went, you better read it because I know you're private, but like, you're in it a lot. And then he read it and then he went, it's just data and you're serving a purpose. And I feel like you must have had similar conversations, did you, like with your partner? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I, I met I met Billy when I was in my late 40s. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's this funny moment where I was, I was, <laughs> I have, you know, they had the patch on. And I was feeling quite ashamed of it. And, and so, you know, I'd have to go to the bathroom and like scratch it off. And I, I don't know if, if you use the patch, but I, if people... It leaves a mark. It leaves a mark. Yeah. And and like the adhesive is not just like ripping a bandaid off. It's, it's like a whole big thing. And so I'd be in the bathroom for like 10 minutes, scratching at myself and probably removing two or three layers of skin and come back with like what looked like a bullet hole. <laughs> just, and eventually, I mean, I think he probably ignored it a, a few times politely. And then eventually he was like, is everything okay? <laughs> and I said, yeah, okay, well, there's this. And I just told him the story and he's like, how can I help? You know, like, mm, don't, oh my please don't. Yeah please don't worry about that. You know, he knows, he knew my age, he knew, he knows how the body works and everything. So it's so much better once you just give over to the truth and just, and everybody knows how to behave once you do that, right? When we, yeah, when we have those allies and our partners and in our workplace and everywhere, it makes the difference. And, and actually going back to something you said, when you like, for me, somebody like me and the people listening to know that somebody like you, Naomi Watts, felt alone and isolated doesn't make sense to us, but it like you were, and it was a, it was real, and we've all felt it. And almost every woman you speak to feels like she's going through this alone. And so I just wondered, like within your industry, particularly, were people talking about it? And if they were, you worried about like bringing this conversation out because you're, you know, an actress? Would were you worried it was going to like change the way people looked at you? Any of those things? Oh, for sure. I mean, the reason, you know, as I said, in my early 40s, where I thought like I should write a book or, you know, put the word out there in some way, create a sexy, fun handbook. I, the, the main thing that stopped me other than I'm not so sure I'm a great writer, but um, I um, I was like, you know, I don't want to end my career. And, you know, the fear was the thing that was driving me most of all. So I wanted to hold on to the secret as long as I could, because yes, Hollywood had told me, I got started late as well for Hollywood years, that it was your career was over by this by a certain time, you know, at 40, for sure, you know. And I said, well, what do you mean that when I was starting out to, you know, agents and people around me, and they were like, well, you know, like, it, it dries up when you when you um, become unfuckable. And Ugh, I said, they're so gross. Ugh. Yeah, so gross. I'm like, well, unfuckable what 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 do you mean I mean I'm looking at Helen Mirren and she's fucking sexy as hell what are you talking about and they said yeah no well um a, a leading lady is you know a different kind of leading lady you know she's probably batshit crazy or you know the psychopath in the you know some kind of losing her mind type of woman after a certain age yeah when you can't have babies yeah they stereotype you when you're not reproductive anymore right yeah, exactly. and it's insulting right it's, but you prove you prove them wrong I love it well I think I mean thank you but I think even though Hollywood gets a bad reputation it is a progressive industry and they do whenever they're sort of facing some kind of issue it does evolve I, I will have to say that in protect and, you know, to protect my industry, which I love and, and have um, been so lucky and fortunate to keep going, but it does move with the times. Um, I wonder and, whether you were was a little bit fearful unnecessarily maybe then 
you know, yeah, because yeah. of the narrative that had been fed to you. And then when you spoke about it, nobody was like, oh my God, we'll never employ her again because she said menopause. <laughs> she probably didn't yeah, think that no, at all. And I did, I did pause. I did take my time with making that decision whether or not to launch Stripes. I had, you know, a lot of time researching brands and, you know, being very interested in skincare and seeing, you know, what I thought was a, a, a white space, if you will, because... I did feel like, although these brands were very strong and efficacious and everything, they I didn't always feel like they were speaking to a woman going through this unique stage. And and I felt like a woman wants to feel reflected. A woman wants to feel, feel directly spoken to in an authentic way. They don't want to be told, if you do put this cream here, you're going to look 28 again. So I... Um, so, but I did, I, I really moved slowly with the idea. And then finally, I think it was, it took the time when we all went into lockdown during COVID where I was just like, okay, I'm putting, I'm going to, you know, put my energy into this and really try to make it happen. And well, there was an origin story to that though, wasn't it? One of your friends that said, you've got to do it now. You've got, I think you said, you told us that at the launch, one of your friends really encouraged you to do it through COVID, right? Now's the time. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was a lot of women around me and, and because I became passionate about skincare, which was because my skin was really one of the main symptoms that I was suffering through and being on film all the time, you know, you really have to have, have look after your skin. So I got very interested and passionate about clean, sorry, clean skincare you know, less you know, taking out all the harmful ingredients, you know, less toxic ingredients. And, and, uh, and I, I, my, I saw immediate results take place right away there. And then, yeah, I, that's when I just said, I'm going to make a call. I'm going to make a call. I know this company called Amaris. I've heard of them. I knew they were in a, a new phase of acquiring brands. They'd already been supplying great ingredients for several years to multiple brands. And, uh, and I pitched, I, it was a cold call. I, I just rang up and said, I, I, want, I have this idea. I want to pitch to you who, who wants to listen. And they right away said they were into it. So I love the, um, as well as the name and, and the products. I love the color. And when I first saw them at the New York event where we met for the first time in in person, I was like, oh my God, I feel like it's gone back to school. It looks like a school uniform color. And you were like, thank you for saying that. You went, you deliberately sort of went for the, like, what are we, Gen? This is an X. Gen X, I don't know. I don't know that terminology is very American, but we're that's like we're like the 70s kids, aren't we? Like yeah. the 60s, 70s kids. Is that what you were going for with that? Yeah, I wanted some, yeah, a little bit of retro vibes, but you know, bold colors was the main thing because I didn't, you know, we're so often shoved to the corner, out to pasture, made to feel invisible, go to the corner with your knitting needles. You know, no, thank you. Let's listen. Never... You and I both knit. We both knit. By so... the way, yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. But moving on, <laughs> I love, I did take up knitting again, actually, recently. And, but I'm on pause again. Maybe it's the season, but also it is. I, I'm in a winter knitter. But, but yeah, like you wanted it, like we often I wanted like, them to we... stand out. Yeah. yeah. Wanted them we to get feel... pastelized don't we as we get older we get like diminished in the way that we're portrayed you know like I, I think it's a, a yeah. really great move and, and and it's reflective of where we are I think it was you know I saw that straight away it's awesome thank and you can I ask you about stripes so because it's to me it's more than just a product right it's like because I I followed you for a long time before we'd be we spoke, right? Because I just wanted to see what was happening. And I mean, that's just me all over, you know, a little bit cautious and everything. And I was like, I was listening to the things you were saying. And I was like, this woman is genuine. She really wants to advocate for women. This is more about just the products. It's about your advocacy work, right? And you may not, you may feel uncomfortable me talking about you like this, but tough. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> but like the, but like it is, isn't it? You understand the power of community because you were somebody who felt alone. You understand the power of education and knowledge because you were left wondering what the fuck's happening to me. Like, and so yeah. can you talk a little bit about what your advocacy work looks like? Yeah. And it's so funny because again, you know, you spoke about me being so private and here I am talking about 
detailed personal stuff. But and if you'd asked me if I would ever be an advocate, I'm not that person to get on a soapbox. I'm really not. Like I'm a shy person. I'm I'm not necessarily an introvert, but I'm always cautious. I have a very strong and opinionated mother. Um, and so I've always thought, you know, I, I, for some reason, I've always been more more likely yeah, to, to hold stay back, quiet. Yeah. 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 So I, yeah, I never w- would have thought of myself as an advocate. But in this case, again, yes, it was a big open space that needed, you know, that needed reflecting, needed some amplifying. We needed to come together and get shouty and noisy. We needed, I mean, the fact that a whole generation of women went untreated and suffered because of what happened with the WHI, you know, it's outrageous. And, and, you know, this is, what every woman is going to face at some point or another, some of them thrust into it much earlier than they're prepared for. So why not have the information before you get there? Why not feel not like it's going to be the end of your life? Like find the community and find a way to thrive together. There is a vibrancy amongst your peers. Once you know what how to handle it, and I mean, obviously we know knowledge is power, but I mean, not to say that through the perimenopause stage where your hormones are going up and down and all over the place, it will be topsy turvy, tipsy topsy, topsy turvy, whatever the expression is. And, but, you know, there are ways to get help and having each other, you can ask the right questions. You can be equipped to speak to your doctor. And if your doctor is brushing you off, you say, thanks, but no thanks. I'm going to the next person. Um, so, but for so long, women were just flailing. And mm-hmm. so it just feels like it, 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 an unfair situation that women had to go through that. Yeah. And and we, Completely. you know, so if I can use my voice in little ways to help women and, you know, actually, Amanda, I recently had really fantastic feedback, the kind of feedback that really sort of gets me choked up actually you know I've had women come up to me on the street and just grab me and look me in the eye and say thank you thank you for giving me permission to speak about it with my husband or with my kids or you know my boss or whatever the the person is but you know if I can affect one person and that one person can tell the next person, you know, like it makes me, it, there's nothing, there's no greater feedback, really. It's exactly that, right? And it's it's an absolute travesty that we're in the situation where there's this huge knowledge gap because, you know, even those women that know what it is really have to fight, like you said, to get heard and get seen. And, and then there's all of those women that struggle and don't even know what they're going through, right? And I know that if we don't do it, then the next generation are going to come along and absolutely steamroller everyone. Just like our, <laughs> our, kids, our kids don't stand for any crap, do they? And so I think that we're really paving the way in a really ethical way. We want it in school so kids even just know the word, right? If the word was yeah. mentioned in our sex ed classes, then great. It's not, we're not going to go into this unknown. If we can talk about it in the workplace and with our partners without like cringing every time, like, and the fact that women are coming up to you and saying, thank you, means you're doing it right, doesn't it? Right. And it's a great feeling. I love it too. Yeah. Well, collectively, I think, yeah, as you say, I think we're, we've definitely, changed things I think and that I think we can feel good about that because it will be the last generation our kids will not feel awkward about having this conversation we are probably the last ones to um suffer in silence and I think that's just nothing but great news it is isn't it so I'm actually going to like change direction completely here because I think I mentioned at the beginning about us both being English and I think that many people probably don't even realize that you are because I know I didn't like when I first met you and you said you were English I was like no you're not (laughs) completely telling you (laughs) it's so funny because English people think I'm Australian and Australian people think I'm English and Americans probably think I'm South African. <laughs> they think I'm all over the place. But I d- it's funny, when I'm with my mum, I sound more English. When I'm with my English girlfriends, yeah, I, I get probably, you know, the English comes back. 
when I'm with my Aussie girlfriends, definitely I get. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, I don't get that strong, but yeah, I mean, I moved around a lot as a kid in England. I lived there till I was 14 years old before we immigrated to Australia. So, and I went to quite a lot of different schools around the country. Um, and, um, I have my accent changed a lot. And I think that was because I was just somebody who wanted to fit in all the time. My brother has the same accent he's always had. He doesn't really sound Australian at all. He sounds absolutely English and we're only 19 months apart. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, you just never know, do you? I mean, I've lived away from the UK now for 25 years, but I think when you leave at a certain age, it it stares your accent. And in fact, I think I've become more Northern. Yeah, that's so funny. Uh, Yeah, I know. I think my brother the same, not Northern, but sounds more English. But I, uh, yeah, I I was 14. So I think I was still very impressionable. Impressionable, yeah. 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 And maybe the actress was already inside of you. The creativeness was there, possibly, yeah. All right. So serious question, Vegemite or Marmite then? So raised on mom, raised on Marmite, converted to Vegemite, I'm afraid. Can I give you my, uh, I think I can accept that because Vegemite spreads easier. It just does. And it's that little bit less salty. Salty. Yeah. Yeah. But fine, I'll, I'll go, I know, forgive me. I know that's a terrible thing. I'll still go Marmite. And you know what I love more than anything is, do they still do them? Twiglets with the- Twiglets? Oh yeah. my God. Oh my God, with Twiglets. Marmite. So so you're on your way home, you you just said, and you're going to go and see your 100 granny. year old granny. Yes. She's turning 100 and I'm going to go and see her and meet some relatives I've not met, some that I haven't seen in, you know, over, oh God, more than a decade, like years and years. Um, I'm going to surprise her. So hopefully <laughs> this is going to play. I don't, I don't think, I don't think Granny listens to my podcast. <laughs> I, thought, I can't imagine why not. But will you take, uh, go buy some triglets for her? Go and sit and yeah, have some triglets yeah. with your granny. So I want. So we we were just talking about this quickly before we started recording, and Bean is dead, sadly. But I wonder whether Charles will write her a letter because that's standard practice. Like that I know, would be exciting. I, know. I I mean, yeah. I hope he hasn't changed that tradition, right? Like he he must be keeping up with certain certain things, right? Um. So I imagine, yeah. When did yeah so she's June end of June so I mean how many letters could he possibly have written I don't know do they, do they, yeah, she might be one of the first but do they like turn up on the doorstep with the white gloves and a silver plate and then oh, I, don't, I, hope, <laughs> yeah, I hope so they bloody <laughs> should <laughs> right <laughs> yes they bloody <laughs> should they should get more than a letter but I mean that's that must give you like a lot of inspiration as well like my grand passed about five years ago and I'm so devastated oh. even to this day because she was the matriarch she was the one that was the most vibrant person ever really fiercely independent and do you feel like that about you you both your grandmas right I've got two grandmas and my other one's turning 98 this year um, in Australia yeah I'm closer to my mother's grandmother which is the Australian one in fact she raised us for a portion of time and she was the matriarch definitely and and um my mum has two sisters, so there's a lot of, you know, female energy in in the family. All strong women. I'm very, very close with all of them. Oh, On my dad's that. side, less so because he passed away when I was very young. But I do need to get to know that side of the family. Better. And it's inspiring, right? Because, I mean, one of the narratives we hear all the time with menopause, I think more in the UK, unfortunately, is a little bit doom and gloom. And I hate it. And I fight back about it all the time. You see me, I sort of rally against it. And I want to hear about like these vibrant women that are like fantastic and that are changing the world. And you've got all of you four waiting for you, right? And, and I think that that's truly inspiring. Yeah. No, I mean, I've always looked up to women who are you know, older than me as, you know, for their wisdom and, and I find them very inspiring. So hopefully. I'm excited for you to go back. So the next question is, are you going to have a chip butty? 
Oh, of course. And well, you're going to get Billy to have one too. I might have to, right? Have yeah. To. So the chip butty, that's so funny that you, wait, it's because I we, made a post, didn't I? We I bonded over, we bonded yeah. over the chip butty and I bought you some Sarsons vinegar. That's right. So um, it, it was funny because after swimming, when I was a kid, you know, you would always be cold and hungry. Um, and at the, um, at the, uh, gym or wherever I went to go swimming, I was allowed a chip butty and we were pretty healthy. I, my mom was, you know, like really healthy with food and everything. And we weren't allowed, you know, like junk food or much too much, too many sweeties or anything like that. She was always good about food, but at my grandmother's that it wasn't as strict. And, and so we were allowed to order a chip butty just when we went for swimming lessons I guess what oh, on Thursday man, perf- or whatever perfect though right it's yeah the perfect thing to have after swimming yeah and then my grandfather thought he was so hilarious my Welsh grandfather for Christmas would make one on Christmas Eve like probably drunk off his head <laughs> and wrap it up in tin foil and put it on the Christmas tree for us that was your present. <laughs> and then you went on Jimmy Fallon and told him about it. And he was like, what's a chip butty? And then didn't he try one or something? He I tried mean, it. And he was like, it was so dry. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? He didn't do it right. And I was really mad watching him going, oh, don't like downplay how gorgeous this is. Because you get the right British bread. Bread in America is shit. Sorry, yes. Americans. It's proper stodgy bread with butter on. And then your chips, which are fries for you guys. But they're proper chips from a chip shop. And they're yes. like, and they're like, really salty with vinegar on and it's just the best oh my goodness yes. and yeah right. butter is the key you must have butter <laughs> like you can't have a sandwich without butter I know <laughs> you sound like Monty Python you can't have a sandwich without butter <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm excited for you going home I'm a little bit jealous when anyone goes oh my god oh but I mean that's yeah. nice and um it would be lovely for you to catch up with your family and everything and then so apart from you like taking a little trip over there, what else have you got coming up? What's exciting in the world of Naomi Watt? Well, some things I can talk about and some I can't. I've got a show that I just finished for FX called Feud about a very interesting time in New York, really a bygone era. Truman Capote and the women that he used to hang out with, which were he called the swans. And it's pure elegance set in the sort of 50s through the late 70s. And so that stars Tom Hollander, who plays Truman Capote. And um, we've got a fantastic group of women, Diane Lane, Chloe Sauvigny, Calista Flockhart, Demi Moore, and Treat Williams, bless his heart. Oh, he just passed, just away. passed didn't yeah. he? Oh, Shocking. yeah. Absolutely tragic, devastated. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. That was super sad. The Truman Capote thing I'm really excited about. I read a book by, well, the book about the Vanderbilts by Anderson Cooper, and he talks about yes. them in there. And it's such a really great book because it's sort of the inside knowledge to it. So when we, when can we expect to see that? I can't tell you exactly, actually. I think it's, it's just, next year, but I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, yeah. I'll keep you. And then, awesome. and then what about the, like, the, with stripes? I mean, are you coming to Canada? Oh, gosh, I know. Hopefully this year, Canada, UK, and Australia by the end of the year. So, and we've got some new launches coming out towards the end of the year. Yeah, we're, we're and now we're on Amazon and Sephora.com. And I, I, the broader this conversation gets, the more normalized it can be, the better it, it will be for everyone. So, yeah, yeah. no, it's really reach. exciting. Yeah. And I know people ask because they're like, I get messages going, is he coming to Canada? Like I have the inside scoop. <laughs> well, I sort of do now. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah it's, we'll it's, be there soon. 
Let's be there soon. So I, I won't keep you much longer because you've I've taken up a lot of your time. But I would like to ask you to finish with like some sage advice, because I always think that, you know, when you sort of through the other side and you can sort of see the light at the end of the tunnel, it doesn't feel like a dark cave. And um, it's sometimes nice to give women a little bit of hope and share a little bit of wisdom with them. And so is there anything that you would like say to someone who is struggling right now or someone who feels a little bit lost and alone during perimenopause? Yeah, I mean, I would just say, make sure you bring everyone around you into the conversation. Um, Don't be alone. There's no shame in it. It's always how the body was supposed to work. Yeah, don't suffer in silence. And the more open we are with those around us, the more they know how to behave and how to help and be empathetic. What's interesting is... Nowadays, as we are having kids much later, the collision of one's plummeting hormones and their raging hormones is is quite unusual. But we always we always offer them, you know, empathy, and we know what they're going through. So bring them into the conversation just around the dinner table. You can have a joke about it if you need to, but just say sometimes mum's not feeling great either. You know, like. And, you know, that goes for sharing it with your partner as well. And I just think taking the taboo out of it, it just makes it so much easier. And the other thing I would just say is trust that once you're on the other side of it, it is actually a reclaiming of yourself. And that with that comes a lot of vibrancy. You make decisions that are really connected to your most authentic self because it's not the hormones driving you. And in fact, my hormones have definitely got me into trouble before. <laughs> so I feel you're, you actually can be your best self on the other side. So trust that. that that's going to come. Yeah. And I can concur. Like I never thought I'd feel this way again. You know, we've yeah. been in places where we didn't think we could like keep going on like we were. And when you reach sort of the other side, it's like, I want to tell everyone and it shouldn't yeah. be radical. I've said that before. Yeah. So yeah. And thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. It was so special for you to do this. I know my listeners are in for a treat and thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for writing this fantastic book and entertaining us and with, you know, your fantastic spirit and your humor and your great knowledge about exercise and all of that. And actually, I want to ask you a question because I'm allowed. Am I allowed? And we're switching roles here. This is not okay. (laughs) If everyone wants to turn off, that's fine. (laughs) But, you know, I have this debate with my friends who I exercise with and we're all into exercise. And, and one of my friends is just defiant that she doesn't want to bulk up. And I'm like, stop with that nonsense. You've got to actually use weights, right? So can you elaborate for me so I can tell her with great instruction? Confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Confidence. So- so what happens is as we age and as we go through menopause, we our estrogen is intrinsically part of our muscle stimulus, like to grow and maintain muscle. And so the when we lose estrogen, the ability to sustain the lean body mass we have it diminishes significantly. And so if you don't do your best to hold on to muscle, then it starts to go. So first of all, it's sort of a a critical thing to do strength training because when you don't have muscle, you become at greater risk of falling and breaking bones and all of the independent stuff that matters as we get older. But the stimulus to actually create muscle to grow requires enough protein to make that you know, that's the fuel for it, the building blocks for it, I should say. And strength training is the stimulus that makes it happen. But it's actually impossible to get really, really big. I mean, I've been trying for years to get bigger. (laughs) But it's really hard because physiologically, we don't have that hormonal makeup. And if you really, truly wanted to get bigger, you would have to eat an excessive amount of calories. You probably would have to have injections of testosterone and human growth hormone to make it work. We were not built that way, but we are built. And in fact, usually muscle, when it when you start to build muscle, it takes up a lot less space. So rather than if somebody maybe wants to change body composition, 
they tend to get smaller when they do strength training because the muscle, like I say, it takes up a lot, a lot more space and is a little bit more dynamic metabolically. And so when women say they're going to get big, it's pretty much physio physiologically impossible to happen. But on the flip side of that, if they don't consider doing it, they may be at risk of things that like are, are the things that causes problems later in life. And and being strong doesn't mean you need to get big anywhere. Being strong can look different for everyone. You have a hundred year grandma and a 98 year old grandma and what's relatively strong for them is different to what's relatively strong for us, right? Them taking the shopping bags like from the kitchen to the, I don't know, like from the shops to the kitchen is probably enough for them, right? But for women in their 50s, like they should try and grasp onto their power as much as possible because we start to lose it. In, yeah. a, in a negative way, yeah. Don't really answer the question in that way, but you, no, can't, you, you can't. You can't get big. I'd like yeah. them to show me how. Yeah, exactly. And I find, I mean, my workouts have definitely changed because of my age. And, you know, I did, didn't did used to like to lift weights at all. And I love to do all that jumping. And, you know, I can't do any of that anymore. My My back can't handle impact and my knees can't either. But so I've, what I've learned is that using weights like as heavy as I can almost with yep. less repetition. Exactly. Right? If you're working in like a six to eight to 10 rep range with a weight that makes you feel tired when you do it, you want to look fit, fit, fatigue, right? You're not looking, you shouldn't tickle. You should just all feel tired at the end of it. But if you could do a, a little bit of jumping in there, it would be good, but it doesn't yeah, sure. have to be a lot. You know, like a little bit of farting around, jumping around in the kitchen is good for your bones too. I've seen you. <laughs> I've seen you dancing in the kitchen. <laughs> yes, I like. Yeah. Don't worry. I, I still do a little bit of cardio, but I that that used to be my entire workout, and now yeah. I and I too. think that if we can move women away so they still have the cardiovascular element because we need it for our heart and our overall health, but to at least find two or three times a week to include some strength work and move move more I think we need to just think about moving more like I've seen you start to do in pickleball like that's oh a really fun cool activity it's the biggest growing sport in America I think right I'm obsessed I mean I've got my own net Amanda I've got my own uh. paddles I'll show up and, and set set a game wherever I can I love it and it's not like everyone, my kids are laughing at me going, oh, mom, you're like a hundred year old with your pickleball, just play tennis. You know, it's it's not just for old people, by the way, I, I say, I've seen kids in their twenties playing it. <laughs> so Yeah, no, and I think it's it's fun. And that's sort of the other side of it as well. Like sometimes strength training is hard to imagine enjoying, right? People want to do activities they enjoy. And I highly encourage that because something is always better than nothing. But I would say to any woman that thought that they weren't going to like it, would try it. Try it for a month. Try it for six weeks and see how you feel at the end of it. Do it like a gauge because I most women that do it feel so much better at the end of the six weeks. They're like, well, why didn't I try that before? And right. the, like the benefits completely, there is no negatives, I yeah. think. Yeah, I'm biased. Well, I want to make it onto one of your retreats. I, f I had major you FOMO. Do? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Okay, I can make that happen. Oh, I would love that. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. We have a lot of fun and we eat a lot of good food. I'm all about trying to find that perfect balance of eating yeah. good food and moving enough. That's the way to live, right? Good food, good exercise, good, good company. Good memories, yeah. Good making great memories and uh, yeah, experiences all the way. Yeah, and that's actually a, re a really great thing to remind people to do because we get bogged down in the horrible stuff that's going on at the moment, don't yeah. we, often? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, thank Many you. things to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, we do. We totally do. Um, I really enjoyed speaking to you. It's like speaking to an old pal. I love that. It's so yeah, nice. Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much for listening to the show. If you like what you hear, then why not subscribe to this podcast and leave me a review? 
You see, when you do this, it helps to raise the profile of my show and attract new listeners. And it also allows me to continue to deliver valuable content with great guests. And in return for you doing that, I will send you my 12-week core-focused program called Abs on Fire as a thank you. Simply drop me an email at amanda at amandasteve.com and I'll wing that your way. Bye.